You are listening to Proof of Love with Tatiana Moroz, Dr. Stephanie Murphy, and Lauren Kasovitz. This show may contain adult content, language, and humor and is intended for mature audiences. If that's not you, please stop listening. Nothing you hear on Proof of Love is intended as financial advice, legal advice, therapy, or really anything other than entertainment. Please take everything that you hear with a grain of salt. Oh, and if you're hearing us on an affiliate network, the ideas and views expressed on this show are not necessarily those of the network that you're listening on or of any of the sponsors or affiliate products that you may hear about on the show. Now that that's squared away, let's start the show. Show me your heart. to our sponsor, blocktap.io. Please go to their website and check out their universal cryptocurrency API to get reliable cryptocurrency data. Blocktap.io. Will you be in New York for Blockchain Week? If so, come by 235 Fifth Ave for a special community event that brings together some of the brightest stars in crypto. Saturday night, May 11th from 7 p.m. to 1 a.m. Join Tatiana Moroz, Michael Salvi, Naomi Brockwell, Bailey Rutzel, and so many more of your favorite crypto friends for a night of music, comedy, and live entertainment. It's free to attend, so register now. Go to CryptoStarEvents.com. And also, I want to say a special thank you to our sponsors, Chia.net, BlockTop.io, Edge, Sonic Scoop, Bitcoin Magazine, Lennox Group, and of course, Crypto Media Hub. So make sure you go to CryptoStarEvents.com and get your tickets now. Hello, and welcome to Proof of Love. I'm very happy to be joining you today, as I'm always happy to be joining you, because this is a great chance to hang with my friends, talk a little bit about things that are on my mind and things that might be on your mind. Uh, I'm joined today by the beautiful Dr. Stephanie Murphy. Hey, Stephanie. Hello. Nice to be here with you. I know. I'm excited for today, even though it's a little bit of a bummer topic. Unfortunately, Lauren isn't able to join us today. She's got this whole job thing going on, which I'm not really thrilled about, oh. but you know, I guess you got to make <laughs> money. And I'm happy that she's she's happy at her job. So I'm, not, I'm just kidding, obviously. Absolutely, um, Lauren. We support you. <laughs> yes, we, are, we love you, Lauren, and we'll see you on the next show. So today's episode is about alcoholism. And the reason why I wanted to do this episode, I mean, you know, proof of love, it doesn't really have anything to do with dating, but it does have something to do with self-love and how we treat ourselves. And this is something that affects lots of loved ones. And maybe some of the people in the audience might be thinking, "Eh, I don't know, I've been having a couple too many glasses of wine. And I have a very good friend of mine and they have been struggling with alcoholism for close to 20 years now. They were just in a one year long rehab where they were living in the rehab. And then they had this really big relapse. And I was really, really frustrated with them because, you know, there's a certain point where you start feeling you're investing in somebody that's not really investing in themselves. And I expressed that on Facebook and it was one of the most popular posts that I've done in a really, really long time. I think we had at least 400 comments of people going back and forth. And I realized, wow, this is something that really resonates with a lot of people. So a good friend of ours, Chris Groshong, has been kind enough to join us and share a little bit about his journey and some of his struggles, which I have to applaud him for being so brave. Some people are, you know, this is something that people hide, right? It's not the greatest way to present yourself, but it is something that affects millions of people around the world and it's a very serious problem. So I'm really excited that he's willing to talk with us openly about how he's conquered some of those I don't know, inner demons, for lack of a better uh, expression. So thank you very much, Chris, for joining us today. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me, ladies. Awesome. So you are actually a member of the cryptocurrency community. Maybe you could give our audience a little bit of background of you know, what you do in this space right now, not necessarily how you got in, because I think all those things are tied together. But if you could just give us a brief bio for people who haven't maybe heard your podcast or worked with you before. Yeah. So I run a consulting firm out of San Diego called Coinstructive. And our biggest focus right now is actually on continuing professional education. So depending on what vertical or industry you're in, like accounting or lawyer, being a lawyer or banking compliance or even law enforcement, something like that, we have continuing education courses that help explain and get people up to speed on how it impacts their their role at their job. And for a lot of these people, they know that this industry is coming. And so we help 
bridge that gap while they can get continuing education for their licensing agreement or their licensing needs. So that's mainly where we focus on right now. And and we're, like I said, we're based in San Diego and we really uh, do a lot of work with the community as far as legislation, and regulatory work as well. So we kind of keep it well balanced. Awesome. I know you've been doing a lot of very good work and, and I love your approach to kind of making things easier for just the average person to understand and not necessarily bogging them down with a lot of technological gobbledygook book that can turn them off and helping bring more people into the space. So thanks for all your hard work. Yes. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. The meetup group in San Diego is, is alive and strong. So it's still one of those things things that if you're not active in your community, then you really don't understand what people are looking for, what their pain points are or their problems. So if you're not out there and talking to those people, then how can you help provide solutions for them? Excellent. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your journey with alcohol? So I, you know, I grew up in a household where my dad didn't drink because he was an alcoholic. So he had stopped drinking before I was born. So I never really experienced it from like an abusive standpoint because he knew it was a problem and he, they, you know, my mom and him worked through that and addressed it. So, you know, when I look at my father's side of the family, there's a lot of alcoholism, grandfathers, uncles. I mean, I have an uncle right now that I think lives in a trailer on somebody's property and is a raging alcoholic. So I kind of had, at least for me, I had the path in front of me of like how you how you can end up. So being already like at least aware of the issues and the problems that I might face, because I mean, going to you know college and partying and we've all probably at some point or another, unless we're just don't drink at all, but have drank too much. <laughs> and and what I found was it became a necessity and a part that I integrated into my life. So that even when I was getting like trashed, I was always, my goal was always to be able to maintain at a level to where I didn't lose control. So, you know, a lot of people would use alcohol to party, but what I ended up doing is I liked the feeling. So I just wanted to maintain that feeling for as long as I could and as stable for as stable of a period as possible. So what that involved is drinking in the morning, drinking at lunch, drinking in the afternoons and basically you know it turned over time because it just you don't just wake up one day and start doing it but it's like over time you just like you know what maybe i'll just have a shot to feel better in the morning and then you're like by the time lunchtime comes around and you're like you know what let's go out to lunch so i can grab a beer and it looks normal but you're it's right. just so, like it's just like anything that's addictive it's there's a timer in your head that says time for more and that was the thing that uh was driving me insane. So Chris, are you saying it was kind of creeping up on you? Like at first, you know, it was just like, okay, this is my limit. I'm going to have this much. And then to, more beyond that would be too much. And then the threshold was kind of gradually getting higher and higher. Well, yeah, because, you know, you can build up a tolerance, right? So when I was in my full, like my full alcoholic mode, like when I got into like, okay, I need to drink to maintain this lifestyle, i basically went to work every day and then I would come home and I would drink at least a half almost a half a bottle of vodka a day and I would have have these I would have these cycles and these periods where I basically just did enough to like get to work and not get fired and survive and then I'd have to like kind of come out of this like you know drunken comatose and like pay bills and make sure that I didn't like lose complete you know, and utter, my life turned into complete utter chaos. Right. So you were just striving to be, to be functional and to not let other people know that it was causing a problem for you and maybe not even let yourself know that it was really causing a problem for you. Is that right? Well, I would say that I knew that it was causing a problem for myself, but it was more of, I didn't want to listen to that part of it. Like that voice right. was there because I'd already knew like, okay, well, your dad doesn't drink at all, but your uncle's a total raging alcoholic and can't keep his shit together so how do you want to end up and you're like right. well and so you know, i'm in my it? 20s so like yeah well whatever like everybody's drinking like fish like like when we go out that's what you do like you go to the bar you go to you know and that's to me that was normal uh that's just what life was was and so but it also turned into i feel like shit all the time also and i but i have to maintain this lifestyle because it's it's a substance issue, right? Right. So, yeah, I mean, it sounds like there were some 
definite downsides that you were seeing to, you know, how much you were drinking. But then also there were probably some benefits or some payoffs, right? Like it, it would make you feel good, at least for a little while. Is that right? Well, I think, yes, absolutely. There was moments of where I used it as a crutch to feel like I needed it to help me with either social interactions or maintaining a, a level of, I felt like I was trying to use it for actually like to gain clarity which sounds uh, totally backwards. But when you, I would get also get uh, like a sugar rush because I'm consuming so much alcohol that my body actually processes the alcohol slightly differently over time to where it converts a lot of it into sugar. So actually one of the things when I first started to quit drinking, my dad said, you're going to get a sweet tooth because your body's used to processing so much alcohol into sugar. And so it's true. Now I, I never used to eat like sweets at all because I was drinking it. And now I actually enjoy like desserts and sweets and things like that more. But Oh, that's fascinating but, to hear about that. Because so, yeah, there is like a biological thing where sugar yeah. is also addictive, just like alcohol. A lot of people talk about sugar addiction. But I, I, I know people who have quit drinking or avoided drinking For example, one of my family members had many brothers and sisters and uh, was coming from a Catholic family. And pretty much all the siblings ended up as alcoholics except for him. And But he was always carrying around candies, like sugar, wherever he went. He always had these little hard candies that he was eating and there were always sweets in the house. So I I just thought that was fascinating, right? There's something going on there where there's a similarity between alcohol and sugar. Yeah, and that's it's just a biological process. At that point, it's your body is saying, okay, well, we're trying to make and store energy, and this is our source. So how do we process that? Like, the, like a lot of the gum that you buy has alcohol sugar, right? That's a sugar-free, yeah. but it's an alcohol sugar. And so it's a lot, it's your body processes it differently. Let's actually just say a little bit about the, bio- the biology of that. So we all know that when, you know, when we're looking at the nutrition information on foods and stuff, that fat has nine calories per gram, and then carbohydrates and protein have four calories per gram, right? Well, alcohol is actually in the middle. It's like seven or something like that. And when our ancestors were foraging in the jungle for fruits and veggies and whatever they could find to eat, sometimes fruits would fall off the tree and then they would get fermented, right, by yeast. Mm -hmm. And then the yeast would turn the fruit sugar into alcohol. Now the alcohol was providing even more calories than a similar source of sugar. And so then this was like beneficial to cavemen who were trying to survive, right? And so we developed like kind of a, a taste for this. Oh, this can actually help you. And it can make you feel good. It has this interesting side effect. So some people theorize that this is how this biological drive to consume alcohol started. That's interesting. So Chris, what was the what was the breaking point? Like what happened? So you're you're chugging along, literally, and you're realizing that things are sort of getting out of control. Was there some sort of a moment? You know, people talk about rock bottom. What ended up happening? So my previous background before crypto was biotech and pharma. And I have a degree in genetics from UC Davis. And so I moved to San Diego and I was working in the biotech industry after living in the Bay Area growing up there. And so I, what I was noticing was I was not really, my job was not exciting to me and it was a job. It wasn't a career. So what I, what I ended up having to do was basically just understand what was going on in my life. But I didn't have the clarity to do that because I was in this drunken fog constantly. So what happened was a a year-end review came around, and I was basically on the verge of getting let go because of how bad my performance was. And it was a real wake-up call because, I mean, it's like getting a report card with a bunch of Fs. It's like, oh, what just happened? And so I was like, I really don't want to lose my job. So I guess I have to like pick things up and shape, shape up a little bit and turn things around. And so that was one of the first things. But the, the other thing, because I am a scientist, my thought was, okay, well, let's run a test. And maybe if you can, which like, like most people think that there's a way that they can cut back. But if you're an alcoholic, like cutting back is not really the answer uh, because there's, it's a problem in the first place. So what I did was I tried to cut back. And so after you know, uh, four to six weeks, I was 
back to drinking, if not more, at least the same amount that I was then. And, and I go, okay, well, all right, let's just, let's, you know, let's repeat this. Let's try this again. Let's just do it over. Maybe I'll just be a little more diligent this time. Well, you, re you repeat an experiment in the lab and you go to your boss and say, hey, I got this answer. I repeated the experiment. I got the same answer twice. That could be enough for them to move up forward with multi-million dollar decisions about how they want to proceed. And I'm thinking, I just did this twice now, this experiment myself, and now I have the same answer. What is my life worth to me? And that to me was like the, the light bulb for me as a scientist went off and said, you are an alcoholic and cutting back is not going to work. So you have to do something else. And to me, it was, I need to stop drinking. And, and that was the first thing was admitting really to myself that I had to actually just stop. It wasn't going to be something because I always figured, oh, when I'm 60 and when I'm 70, like I'll still be able to sit around with my friends and like we'll have beers and, you know, drink wine. And, I, you know, when you're young, you just think like the world at some point will always be a party. And I was waking up to that. And so that was the first step was really just admitting to myself after having done some of these experiments and getting some really bad reviews at work that it was time to reevaluate my life. Yeah. When we're talking about any kind of addiction, it can be really easy to convince yourself that, Hey, this is, this is okay. You know, I can handle this. This isn't really that much of a problem. I can just keep on going with this. And when that happens, it's like you, you almost can't trust your own sense of reality. You know, it's very disorienting. So some people like to look to outside benchmarks of like, what are the signs that this might be a real problem for me? And Chris, did you, did you ever do that? Did you ever look, look up a list of, okay, when is, when is it a problem and when is it not? Because it sounds like you're saying when you tried to cut back and were unsuccessful, that was when you knew, okay, this is actually a real problem. So what are the signs basically that it's, that it's a real issue? So I, I want to make the uh, upfront statement and say I never went, I went to a few AA meetings, but I didn't work the, all the steps. So I'm, I'm not exactly the gleaming example of like what you should do by the book of how to do it. But that doesn't mean that it's not successful for me, at least to keep from alcohol or stay away from alcohol. But one of the things that, you know, even like talk, having somebody to talk to about it, I think is one of the first things. Because if you're thinking about it a lot, then it's already a problem. Because most people are not thinking about alcohol. So like that may come up like when they're at the store and they're like, oh, that salmon, maybe I should get some Chardonnay. That would be awesome for dinner. Um, or they're thinking about it when they go out. But they don't think about it when they wake up in the morning. They don't think about it while they're like taking a break from work or while they're at their desk or while they're everywhere. Like it just, when you, when it consumes your spare time and that's one of the biggest keys is what do you do in your spare time? I, my other eight hours after work that I was awake and at home or whatever, I was drinking. That was my hobby. So, you know, that's one of the biggest signs is where's your free time going? I would say the second biggest thing is who are the people that you surround yourself with. So everybody talks about how you manifest your own destiny and you bring things into the world that you want. Well, if you think that it's acceptable and normal behavior, but you also know that there's people who don't agree with you, are you gonna hang out with the people who don't agree with you or are you also gonna hang out with the people who do the same things you do, make you feel safe and don't judge you because they're also alcoholics. And so you have to also take a step back and look at who you hang out with, where, where do you spend your time, and how do you spend your time? And that's, those are the three, you know, the, the time portion, right? That's the third part. So if you can really look at those three things and determine, like, what do you do in your free time, who are your friends, and where are you spending it, and where are you spending your time? Those are the kinds of things that I think a person can do right away to take a quick evaluation of how much alcohol plays into their life. So then how do you start? Okay, so you know that you have a problem and and you identify it. You know, part of having that support system I think is helpful and something I want to maybe bring up a little later is just 
how difficult that is for your support system. But, you know, how do you actually physically get yourself to stop drinking? Is it just pure willpower? Do you do rehab? Like, what do you think of AA? What was your, what was your method? Some people, they switch it over into something else. So I'm, um, for me, so it was diff. Okay. So first, first off the decision to just try trying to stop was a process for me, obviously. Right. Like it wasn't like, I'm just going to quit today. Some people can cold Turkey. Uh, obviously there's a lot of medical issues that can come up if you try to, if you're a heavy drinker and you try to just stop. So I wouldn't necessarily advise that as a path. And none of what I'm giving is like medical advice or anything like that, but I'm just, there, it, it's serious. It, Nothing it's, you ever hear on this show way. is medical advice, by the yeah. way. <laughs> it's <laughs> like it says in our disclaimer. It's, um, it, it's definitely an issue for people who are, are fully, you know, fully still drinking and haven't like tried to even taper off. So I was tapering off at least to the point where I, okay, I have tried this a couple times now I'm feeling better. And, and I just had to like remove all the alcohol from the house. And I, I purchased non-alcoholic beer because for me, a lot of it is just like when people talk about having an oral fixation from smoking, which I also used to smoke because those two things go together a lot, was having something in your hand. And it, for me, during the first year of recovery, it was very important to me that I still had something in my hand. So when I was out and when I was doing things, but the first three months, I didn't go out at all. And because I didn't want to tempt myself or put myself in a situation where I would relapse. And I didn't actually know how long that time period was going to be. I just said, I'm not going to go out and hang out with the same people because it's going to be awkward. I'm going to have to answer a bunch of questions. And I really don't want to have to deal with that at this moment. I just want to not drink. <laughs> um, and so I had married? to basically, yes, I was married. Okay. Um, oh no, I wasn't married at the, no, I wasn't married at the time. I had a, my, I had a girlfriend who, uh, shortly after became my fiance. So that was the other thing. Like it was also causing issues in my relationship, uh, to a degree. And so there was, a, it wasn't just work, right? There was, it was affecting personal relationships. So I didn't have any family here in San Diego. So I didn't have to really worry about seeing people on a regular basis that, would bring things up to me either. So I didn't have an accountability other than to myself. And so dealing with that, I think was one of the, the most difficult things initially was putting restrictions on myself and limitations of how I thought it was going to be best to like proceed to recovery. Yeah. If I put myself in those same situations again, I was more than likely going to end up doing the same thing by the end of the night. And I didn't want to do that. So avoiding some of those things until you're ready to deal with them, because I'm a social person, I realized after about three months, I felt like cooped up and I was like, I have to get out. I still have to go see people. Uh, some of these people hang out at bars. Guess what? There's bars everywhere. You're not going to be able to get away from bars. Uh, I can't not go to the grocery store or stop into a 7-Eleven or a Quickie Mart just because they sell alcohol or cigarettes there. You can't avoid it. You just have to learn how to deal with it in the situations. So as long as I could get a club soda and have a drink in my hand or get a non-alcoholic beer and have something to hold on to, uh, that for me was a good first step into making it feel like I was doing the same things that I had always done. And that first year is super important because the first time you uh, experience like uh, Memorial Day without drinking beer or going to a a sporting event or whatever it is, the things that you normally do in your life, when you start doing them again without alcohol, it feels really weird. And so it's almost like you have to retrain yourself how to live your life. And that's really hard. Yeah, it's it sounds especially hard when you've designed your life almost in a way that supports, you know, a lot of drinking. And then suddenly, not only do you have to stop drinking, but you also need to sort of change your entire life, your social circle your habits. You have to be aware of it at all times because you're kind of swimming in this culture that's constantly tempting you with the stuff that you're trying to avoid. I, I totally agree. I think the same thing goes for people who like have, um, you know, addictions to food or eating disorders, or even like when people go through weight loss in general, like you don't just lose it overnight. 
And so all these things I want people to know, like if you are dealing with alcoholism, this may sound overwhelming even. Like I have to do all these things. Like I just wanted to stop drinking. I just wanted to do one thing. <laughs> and now you're saying it's going to be all these things. That's overwhelming. I don't want to do that. It's too much work. Uh, my life is really not that bad. Um, but I'm telling you, my life got exponentially better once I did some planning and figuring out how I could better utilize my time to enjoy it in ways that I used to. Like there's still that 15 year old or 12 year old kid inside of you that says, what was fun? What did you enjoy? Like, what were the things that you wanted to do when you were younger that you're not doing now because you're just sitting on the couch drinking? Like, and, and it takes, it takes a real personal deep dive to get in touch with who you were before you became the full on and made the commitment to become a full on alcoholic. And it's different for everybody. And some people don't ever want to make that change. And that's really hard. But at the end of the, you know, at the end of, and the final decision really ends up coming to be on the person who, who has, has the issue and, and the debilitating disease. So Chris, that's really is, the problem. Is there a role for developing skills or tools to deal with discomfort? Because I remember you saying something about one of the reasons that you would often drink was like in social situations to help you feel more at ease and more like, yeah, this is, you're fitting in. You don't feel so so anxious. And I know a lot of people have that. A lot of people are also just, you know, feeling sad or down or depressed or there's something else that they want to avoid feeling. And alcohol is a really great emotional anesthetic. It, it helps kind of numb those uncomfortable, unpleasant feelings. Was that playing into it for you? And then how did you develop tools and skills to deal with discomfort without using alcohol? That's a really great question. It was definitely a slow process. Um, I would say discomfort is, I mean, feeling in general, excuse me, Feeling in general, I think, is the hardest thing to, to get back to because that was basically what you're doing. You're numbing yourself so you don't have to really worry about anything or feel anything. And so, you know, my, my first, it's escapism, you know, and that's what I used it for. And it did a really good job of that. But what it also did was just put everything on hiatus. And I it was basically keeping me from reaching any kind of full potential that of anything that I could possibly done with my life because I dedicated it to alcohol. So then on the discomfort side, I, I think actually it's, it's not really, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily call it discomfort. I would say that it's just getting reacquainted and re-comfortable with who you are because the persona that you've put up to the world is not part of it's you. It's like a, it's like a part truth. But part of it is the alcoholic side because you think, well, that's also what people know now. That's what they like. But really, like, they actually like you for all the other reasons <laughs> besides the alcoholism. Um, and so I think it's, it's really hard to understand that it's not, it's not necessarily discomfort. It's becoming really comfortable with how you are as a person and what makes you happy. Because... When you're happy and people feel that, you know, you can feel that energy and it makes other people surround you and you end up attracting good energy, but it's the investment in the time in yourself to make sure that you keep can, and you can keep reminding yourself and surround yourself with people who support you to tell you that, Hey, I love you for you. And I'm glad that you're doing what you're doing because I, and I want to support you in this because it's making you be not a better person, but able to fully reach your potential and, and give back or open yourself up to the world to where you can be receptive and enjoy what life is really about. Did you lose some friendships along the way? There's people that I don't talk to anymore because our number one connection was over alcohol and they still drink heavily. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's a part of it. But at the time... I was never really worried about losing those friends. I, I knew that it would suck and I knew that I would have to find a new, like a new circle of friends. But mostly what it was, was if you find, if there's something else that you can be passionate about. So I started scuba diving because one, you're not really supposed to be drinking when you're scuba diving. So there was extra incentive. And two, it took up a lot of time. 
And so, and there's a network of people who do it. So I was able to meet new people who also didn't really drink because they also scuba dive. So it was very much that one thing was finding a new way to spend my time. And, and you can still do the other things that you're doing, but if you can just change one thing about your life, even outside of alcohol is find one other thing that's productive or fun for you, you know, join a, join a, a sports league or do something, you know, find a hobby, honestly, that takes up your time. Because if you're bored, you'll go back to doing uh, whatever it was you were doing before. So what about people who don't have something that they're passionate about? You know, the friend of mine that I'm sort of referring to that inspired the episode, they have a hard time choosing what they want to do in life. And they've been very fortunate because their parents have supported them and they've been able to kind of try different things, but not everybody knows what they want to do. You know, I have a passion that I have, you know, with my music and it keeps me kind of focused, but sometimes people, they just don't know what they want to do. Is there something like that you can recommend? I mean, the world is infinite, right? Go out there and find it. But if they're sort of in that semi sludge mode, how do they get out of that? Well, there could be other things going on too, which I think, you know, there's a lot of depression that goes along with alcoholism because you, a, a, after a certain point, there's not really a rush anymore and it's not fun, it's maintenance and alcohol is a depressant. So a lot of times your brain chemistry has changed quite a bit. And it's, you know, if you're not really passionate about something, then the passionate thing that you should, the thing that you should be passionate about is stopping drinking. That's the first thing you have to, that's the thing you ha really have to want to do. Right. And then I guys, I really recommend getting in touch with the younger version of yourself. Um, but if there's trauma, you know, in the younger version of yourself, then you might have to address the reasons as to why you were drinking. So you might, I, I mean, I grew up in a household where my mom was a therapist. So I don't know if that's good or bad, <laughs> but it definitely taught me to be more conscious of my feelings and address them, even though part of the reason I became an alcoholic was to suppress that. So I feel, I feel like there may be other underlying reasons as to why alcohol, and it could be genetic, it could be emotional. And if there's some trauma that's involved, then I think you have to address where some of what the root cause is too. You can't just mask it with something else. So I, I don't want to say like, just supplement or just add in a, a hobby and that will fix everything. Uh, because if you don't care about it, then it's not going to do you any good. So scuba diving was something that I always wanted to do. And now all of a sudden I had extra money because I wasn't spending, you know, every day to buy alcohol. So I think for people who are really struggling with, with an issue and it's the first thing you need to do is be passionate about really wanting to quit and then finding people who will support you and then taking some time to evaluate yourself and what it is in life that you were excited about at any point. And so those are the things that then start to redefine the path of where you want to be in the future. Like it could be, you know what, maybe I don't really like my career and I'm going to do something that takes steps that doesn't happen overnight, but I'm going to build a new path for myself. I'm going to take night school or, um, you know, I'm going to take painting classes or I'm going to learn to play the guitar or speak another language and save some of that money so that I can go to travel to that place. Like there's a lot of things that people want to do in this world. If they have the time to where they can be sober long enough to remember some of those dreams that they had, like alcohol wipes out your dreams. I, it really, it literally takes them away and it makes you only focus on, on it. So, you know, recapturing your dreams is probably the best thing that you can do. What about people? So on the thread, uh, there was a guy who was feeling very sorry for himself. And it was, it was pretty frustrating to read because I've been doing a lot of personal work. I'm trying to grow myself. And I realized that all of these things really stem from the, from the self and from self-love. And he started saying, well, you know, I feel so isolated. If only somebody would come and, you know, show me affection and this disease makes you feel more and more isolated. And while I can empathize with the feeling of isolation, I found it infuriating that he would 
constantly basically ask for other people to provide him the fulfillment within through being part of his life. But at the same time, we're social creatures. So do you think that that's a fair expectation? You know, because some people are alcoholics and they have no friends and they have no family left. Are they just doomed? You know, by his by his argument, it depends on them actually being there versus him taking responsibility for his own mental state. And that's why I found it so frustrating because I think if you're depending on other people, well, who would want to be around you anyway? You're literally covered in beer cans. I mean, he showed me a picture of his floor. It was just all beer cans. So, I mean, that's not a very appealing thing for somebody to be around. So what happens in that case? Is that necessary in order for somebody to, to, to get better? You, well, you definitely need to love yourself. And I mean, I was very fortunate to have to be around someone who also loved me. So that was really great. I think the biggest thing, though, was I, whoever the people around you or not, a lot of it comes from inside. So you do. You ha- it starts with you. And even if you don't have the, I mean, if you don't really have a support system, then that's what Alan, I mean, that's what um, AA was built for, right? And those, it's helped a lot of people. I'm not, I'm not against it at all. My dad went to it and he still goes sometimes. So, you know, it, it, different things for different people that work. And I think that that's the important, the important thing. But I would say in that specific situation, like, yeah, going go to go to some meetings find some people who are can support you by understanding the same situation because if you don't have anybody and your family's given up on you then yeah the hopelessness just feels vast and immense and it's really not it's just your perception of it because as soon as you go into a room and everyone's dealing with the same thing i didn't even talk for the first uh, two meetings that i went to i never i just said my name and i didn't want to share my story i just wanted to listen and and feel it out but the other thing you know there's a flip side to this too because having gone through it from the standpoint of being the one who was the drinker to understanding what it means for my now my wife to have gone through dealing with it from a person who has to live or be around a person who is a, an alcoholic uh, there's this great resource called Al-Anon and that's for people who are family members of alcoholics because what they they're and I'm not going to try to speak for for Al-Anon because I I don't know enough about it because I don't go to Al-Anon meetings but my wife is a huge proponent of it because her brother is an alcoholic so I've seen him and he and I used to drink together um I've seen him lose two two jobs not be able to keep a job now and he is just a full alcoholic and one of the hardest things about that is there's an entitlement that alcoholics feel because of this vast sorrow and depression and immense that they feel that people owe them something to help them like it, i don't know why and i haven't done any research why and so i don't want to get too far out in front of it but i'm just there's a lot of things that alcoholics uh, psychologically go through to where they're the victim and when you're always the victim, that's going to be really hard to pull yourself out. Yeah, that's really hard to to kind of deal with um, as a friend. What do you think about, you know, it, if you're a friend of somebody who's struggling with this and maybe you go to Al-Anon, maybe you don't, but more importantly, I mean, when are you basically enabling them and when do you cut them off? Because alcoholics are notorious liars. They go missing. You know, I'll have a friend and I'll try and reach them and they'll go days and days without even answering. When I ask them if they're drinking, a lot of times they lie. And I start to feel as if it's starting to suck out my own energy. And not only is it sucking out my own energy, but I'm investing it into a black hole because they won't even invest it in themselves. And I found myself just getting specifically the other day furious that I kept dumping my energy into this person that wouldn't wouldn't care. What do you think? Is there is there a point where people should be cut off? Do you think it would have been helpful for you, for example, if your girlfriend had said, "Listen, buddy, if you don't cut this out, I'm out of here." And and did you face anything like that 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 helped motivate you one way or the other? So one of the things that I noticed right away was Julie, my wife, uh, who's amazing, by the way. She get, she did give me a, pretty much an ultimatum because it was my drinking at that point was really bad. 
And so it was, like I said, it was a culmination of like work, my relationship, and just understanding like where I, how much I had to lose. And it was basically everything at that point. Because, you know, I, it was, it was really bad. And that was one of those things that was like, yeah, okay, uh huh, here you go. Do you, do you want to lose all of this or do you want to reevaluate your life and maybe at least take more steps and be more proactive to do that? So that's what I did. But on the other side, what you were saying about, how how do you deal with that from how much time and perspective and like how do you treat a person who doesn't want to help themselves and how much time do you give because how frustrating it is like i i can only imagine because now that i've been sober to see with how to deal with my brother-in-law and how difficult it is and like at a certain point what julie had to do with her brother was say i'm not talking to him anymore because Everything is about him and all of his problems and everything. Even when he's like trying to apologize, there's always an and or a but. And yes, there's a lot of lying. Like there, it's deceptive because people feel bad about it. Like people don't want, like if alcoholism was a cool thing, then everybody would do it. But it's actually not it's not good. It's socially frowned upon. So, you know, people don't want other people to know. So there's this real, there's this real tipping point when it comes internally for the alcoholic of what to do, right? Because you don't want to give up your lifestyle, but you want other people to like you. And so you are basically trying to play both sides and it's exhausting. So eventually what I was, what I, one of the reasons why I really wanted to quit was because I was tired. Like one physically hangovers were like getting even more brutal. Cause I was 31. Um, yeah, it was like 31 and I was like, Oh God, this is like mornings are bad. Like I just, I sweat and I smell like alcohol. Like it was, it was, and I was all, and that's all I thought about. So how often were you drinking in the morning? at that point um probably almost every day like Mm -hmm. at least like a shot or something in the morning like i used to keep a flask in the car um Mm -hmm. and i and i and i would never i would hardly ever drink beer and i would almost never drink wine unless we were out at dinner because alcohol hard alcohol was the smallest amount of volume (laughs) to consume with that packed the biggest punch so that's how I was able to maintain a level was you can just sip on, you know, straight alcohol and I could find a maintenance level. It's, it is the be- the best thing that I, re- the best feeling that I had after about two, I would say two months or so of, of not drinking at all was relief. There was this sense of like being, feeling lighter and like, a weight lifted off of you and just utter relief because it was one thing that you didn't have to think about. Like part of the reason why I didn't like, I didn't just start scuba diving right away after I quit drinking. It was about three months into it because all I focused on for the first three months was just trying not to, to drink. And then I was like, Oh my God, what am I going to do with all this time? Like I sick of watching TV. I haven't gone out. Like I need to get back into the world. And, and so I had to find things that were going to be productive and I had, you know, the support system around to do that. So I think that was, and if you don't have that, I mean, you have to, you have to find, you have to find it in a different way. So I, I really recommend going to meetings as the first place. I don't know. So let me ask you about meetings because first of all, I find it kind of, not realistic for my schedule to want to go to a meeting, but I hear that they have them online. But there's also a lot of criticism of AA, right? And Mm -hmm. some people say that it's kind of cult-like. Some people say it perpetuates a victim mentality. And the percentages of cures uh, of people that are cured with AA are supposedly not that high. I've heard ranges from anywhere from 3 to 8% of people are actually cured using AA. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, I like I said, I didn't use the the full program and I didn't go through all the steps because 
the environment that I, the, for the meetings that I was in, I guess I, I didn't feel comfortable and I had already proven to myself that I needed to quit. So I, I felt, and you know, who knows, I'm sure there's people who are going to listen to this and be like, dude, you did it all wrong. But for me, there was no other, I didn't have another option. Like I, and I just couldn't drink anymore. There was no, to me, there was no other way to go about it. But for other people, I, you know, if you're not, if you're dealing with the situation where you're, you still feel like, you know what, I still want to drink forever. Like then it's not, it's not going to be, it's, you, I mean, it's not going to be possible for you to quit at that point because you haven't, you haven't fully committed to the idea of wanting to quit. So it really, cause it's all, it all ultimately is with the person. They have to take at least the first step and they can't act as the victim. They have to like get past this, um, this feeling of self-loathing or that someone else is going to help them like open the door, take that next step. It's really, that's why, you know, when we talk about, how do you support somebody through this? And when do you cut them off? Like it's different for every situation because you can't give forever. That, that a person who doesn't want to ever change their habits around alcohol will emotionally suck you dry. That it's a one-way street and you'll never get anything back out of that relationship. And relationships are supposed to go both directions. So, at a certain point, you have to protect yourself, and that's what you have to tell the person. You can still do that in a loving way and say, hey, look, I love you. I want you to get better, but this relationship is not a relationship, and you tell them exactly why, and sometimes it helps to write that down and then give that to them afterwards, but look them in the eye and tell them why you can't be their friend anymore, or and not at this moment. You can tell them things like, if you want to get help or you start to get help, I still want to support you. Let me know. Reach out to me. I'm happy to hang out with you. Go to lunch, go to dinner, go to a movie, you know, go to the park, wherever, like sit, hang out, talk on the phone. Like I'll do whatever it is that you need. I'm still, I still want to be your friend, but you have to understand why I can't right now. And here are the reasons why. And then you tell them specifically what it is that they're doing that's causing you to not be a fr- that you can't no longer participate in a relationship like that. I think you really touch on something that resonated with me is that it doesn't feel like a relationship. It feels like I'm a therapist and I am never listened to this person has no awareness of what's going on in my life. And I'm just there to keep giving to the black hole. So I think, you know, laying down some ground rules will be good. And in my case, this person seems to be searching out some solutions right now. And I hope that they're successful. That'll make the friendship a little bit more of a two way street, but it certainly does feel very one way. And as if they think they're the only person that has any problems and it's definitely a burden for me. Uh, which I don't think is how it's supposed to go. No, it definitely is not supposed to be that way. And the other person um, who's the alcoholic, you're right. They don't understand. They don't recognize it. And because you've helped, because you've helped them perpetuate the, the victim role and they can lean on you for that therapeutic, you know, conversation or advice or whatever it is that year that, that you lend, that is an enabling act, right? because they get comfort by having you around, but they don't provide anything back to you. So that's the wake up call for some people is you have to recognize for yourself and love yourself enough to say, this is just a bad situation all around and I'm sorry for this person and I love them and I think they're good, but this is not conducive to a healthy environment and it takes up too much of my time that or whatever those reasons are that taking that step back and letting that person know that is going to be a huge step hopefully for that person to have maybe you're giving them that triggering moment where they're like oh my god i'm gonna lose one of my friends over this and that you know that's really tough you you have to then set those you know draw that line in the sand and say i'm not gonna call them i'm not gonna talk to them on on messaging or text them or whatever 
for until I know that they are able to demonstrate to me that they are either on the right path or whatever. And then you have to still set those ground rules so that when that behavior comes back, if it does on their end, right, that you are able to address it at that moment and say, hey, you are acting and putting me in a, you're acting as a victim and putting me in a role that I'm not comfortable with right now. So I think maybe we should reevaluate where we are with our relationship or our friendship. And I'm still not comfortable in this situation. And you just have to be completely open and honest with them. And they're either going to be receptive to that or they're not. And, you know, there's, there's nothing you can do to a person who doesn't want to, you know, there's nothing you can do for a person who doesn't want to quit, except tell them that you will be there when, when they're ready. What about the idea I, I've, you know, we're getting a little bit uh, later into the show. I'm sure Stephanie may have a few questions, but I have another one that may upset some people and hopefully it doesn't because I don't mean it disrespectfully. But if you have an alcoholic, right, and they can go, for example, the person I'm thinking of, when they're with their parent, they can go for a week and they cannot drink. But then when they're on their own, they basically become a drinker. And I've heard that alcoholism is a disease and that it's something that people can't escape and they're an alcoholic forever. And yet they're able to abstain from drinking at certain times when they're mentally prepared for it. So do you think of it as a disease in that way? And and how do you help people who are not struggling with that reconcile that explanation? Because frankly, it seems a little bit illogical. The disease is cancer. You know what I mean? You, you don't have cancer for like, you don't just like press a button, you have cancer for a week and then you have it again. I mean, I guess you do if it goes into remission or whatever, but you know what I'm saying? Um, how, how would you, how would you explain that to somebody who isn't in that person's position? Why do you think it's a disease versus simply, um, a bad mental pattern? Well, there's some genetics tied to it, right? So that's one thing. And secondly, you know, mental health is something that we don't talk about enough, really. And mental health and mental diseases are just as powerful and and prominent in this world as other types of diseases that we address and give a lot more attention to uh, in the like a physical sense so i mean people don't really bat an eye or think about it twice if someone says oh well you know i'm there's a, a bipolar i'm dealing with bipolar and i'm taking meds for that right? Like, ad <clears throat> that's a totally different thing than addiction. And addiction is not just alcoholism. So there's a wide range of addictions, right? I mean, there's groups for everything. So whether it be food or sex or uh, gambling, right? I mean, addiction is addiction. And that's part of who we are is how we're hardwired and built as humans. <clears throat> and then there's, you can't get around that. So you, you can help control it to a certain degree by, you know, learning some better behaviors. But I don't necessarily think that you can dismiss it from being a disease based on evidence and research that has been done in the past uh, through, you know, medical journals and university studies and just in general. So I think if people are, you know, that situation you mentioned about turning it on and turning it off. I mean, I used to do the same thing because what you're doing is you're using more self-control around people who you don't want to know. So, and, and that is, oh my God, do you don't understand how much effort and energy that takes to do? And it's exhausting. The easier part is just to not be an alcoholic or I mean, to not be a drinker right. um, and deal with your alcoholism. So I've been on, I've been on that side of it. And I wouldn't say that you can just turn it off. You can suppress it. And it's not that they're not drinking for an entire week, but they're, they're either hiding it or they, you know, if they're out visiting their parents, then they am sure they have, oh, I'm going to go visit such and such friend from high school or you know, there's still the local crew that maybe they're connected to. And so they find excuses to go out where they're not drinking at home during the day, every day, and you know, it's temporary. 
So you can deal with that situation because you know like, oh, in a week I get to go back to exactly how my life is the way I want it. And there's that calming sense of that reward at the end. So it, it's all about what is the truth versus what is the mask that you're presenting to, to the world. And I think it's very difficult to, for the, for the friend or for the family who's not necessarily aware or is sensitive to the issues, but doesn't want to stir up problem. Because I was always told like, it was very difficult to talk to, to me because I was edgy because I was nervous about how people would react to me or treat me around because of my alcoholism. So I was always kind of edgy. I was always kind of aggressive or confrontational to a a certain degree um, or um, aloof to where I just didn't want to be around people or didn't want to engage. So these are the kinds of things that alcoholics, um, these are the types of mechanisms that alcoholics use to get by and survive because it's um it's an embarrassing it's an embarrassment to a lot of them you know and so you have to figure out ways to get around around dealing with all of that and so it's it becomes the the drinking is a part of it but how you represent yourself becomes the other full-time job around your alcoholism because it's the how it's presented to the world so you're not just presenting yourself to the world now. You're like, okay, I'm Chris and I'm, you know, X, Y, and Z, but I'm also Chris, the alcoholic. So I also have to like mask that. And so it's almost like I was living two lives at that point uh, in my head. Um, and I didn't really realize that until I was starting to get sober that I was like, there was the alcoholic Chris who presented a totally different person than the non-drinking version and I didn't realize that so it's a there's a lot of things that you have to be ready to deal with yourself I think is one of the biggest things about uh, addiction and alcoholism because it is such a a great way to escape and this world's not easy I mean there's a lot of there's a lot of things that go on for a lot of people and so I don't like I said before I don't know if if just stopping drinking is is going to be the right thing it's many types of positive therapies that could be happening at the same time i would recommend you know if you don't want to go to aa because you think it might be weird or uncomfortable is you know if you have a job and you have insurance i would i would speak with a therapist because it's a it's a great environment to just say things out loud to a person who won't judge you and help you work through some of those thought processes and help you connect the dots to where you can see yourself. Because when you're in the middle of it, it's very hard to evaluate what's going on. I think that people have to embrace the suck. You know what I'm saying? Like, I remember when I did my fast and I didn't eat for seven days. I think that if I had looked at it with just, you know, dread, I'm not sure that I would have made it. But it was like, and I mean, Obviously, it's different not eating food or whatever, but I looked at it and I said, every time I have a hunger pain, I'm going to embrace it and I'm going to lean into it. And I'm going to say, yeah, ah, and then when I would get past it, I would get a really big jolt and I would get a lot of strength from that. So I don't know if maybe that helps for people because this is a little bit of a depressing episode, right? I mean, basically what you're saying is, okay, you're going to have to dig deep into your most miserable parts and it's going to be pretty horrible. But maybe if people can look at that and reframe it at the way that they're perceiving it and they can think of it as something, well, it's like when you're working out and you know, you're doing all your arm exercises and your arms hurt, but then when you're done, you're going to be ripped. So maybe think about that benefit versus the misery of lifting the weights or whatever. I, I totally agree. So I've always been a person who's looked at a long term goal. So when I was 15, I knew I wanted to do genetics. And so I had three years of high school left and at least four years of college. And by that time, the human genome project was going to be done. And I thought there was going to be all this amazing advancement, but I never really thought past that. But I knew at age 15 that I had this career path and I was going to execute on it. And so I did, but I got lost along the way and I didn't keep planning out what I wanted to do with my life. And so I ended up just drinking instead. And so when I 
came back out of drinking, I realized I had all of these like desires and wants for to create opportunities for myself and put myself in uh, a better position because I wasn't really happy with my job. That was one of the problems was what's causing you other um, reasons or what's causing sorrow in your life. Maybe you should stop doing those things. <laughs> and so, but you can't necessarily just like wake up one day and be like, you know what, I'm going to quit my job and not have a plan. So I had to just take this very like steadfast approach to what, where do I want to be in 10 years from now, you know, or five years from now. And I knew, I knew things, I didn't know exactly what I wanted, but I knew that I didn't want to be doing what I was doing at that moment in five years. So what did I have to do? And so part of that was, well, I always wanted to start, a, I always wanted to do video production and make like documentaries about animals. And so because of my scuba diving, I thought, well, what a great opportunity. I can start a video production company and I can do underwater uh, film. Well, that didn't really pan out and neither did the terrestrial work that I was doing because Southern California was such a, is such a hot spot for competitive uh, talent in the, in the, uh, in that space. So what I, what I decided to do was, um, oh, well, well, actually what happened was during this time period, so this, I quit drinking in 2010 and by the end of 2010, I had started a video production company and was working on that 2011, 2012. And it was in 2011 that someone told me about Bitcoin and I was like, I don't have time for this. <laughs> I can't, I can't figure it out right now. And I'm trying to like build this business. And I was like, I want to do this right now. And end of 2012 came around and I wasn't making any money at this side business and Bitcoin came up again. And so I started looking into Bitcoin in 2012 and 2013. And so it, it helped me wake up Bitcoin did, and, but I wouldn't have been able to be in that position if I hadn't quit drinking a few years before. So I, you know, you and never then, know what you might encounter if you take the opportunity and how, you never know how your future self, your future self might thank your current self for taking a step to change your life. Yes. And I know for a fact, I would not be in the position that I'm in today if I had not quit drinking when I had, because when I started constructive in 2015, I already at least had some understanding of the things that it ne I needed to do at least to get a business off the ground. And it wasn't like the first thing I'd ever done. And so those were like, Oh, this is all coming together at the right time because of what I set into motion at that moment back in 2010, you know, in March. And I said, this is it. Today's the last day. And Ever since then, the last nine years, my life has gotten exponentially better every year. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm so thankful for, for everything, uh, family, friends, um, people like you who have been supportive in the crypto community for, it seems like eons now. And um, uh, it's, it's, and it all really goes back to, making that personal decision about this is not the life that was supposed to be for me. It was supposed to be the life that, you know, there was supposed to be a life that I created for myself that I had totally like let go and forgot about. And I, um, I didn't love myself. It was really hard. Yeah. I can hear that you feel regret about that but good for you for being able to turn it around. And I really appreciate you sharing your perspective, Chris. I think if, if people are inspired by what you've said and if they want to maybe do some, just take the first steps in their own life, I think the first step is, is some self-reflection. So, and you talked a lot about that in the show, doing some self-reflection, psyching yourself up and gearing yourself up to make some changes. We also talked about how we can support someone in our life when we see that they might have a problem with alcohol, but ultimately it's up to the individual to, to change themselves. And um, I just wanted to mention something real quick before we wrap up the show here. Uh, there are these, these four questions that have 
I've seen that there are studies that this is able to identify like 90% of alcoholics just with these four questions. So I'm going to, I want to say those on the show and they're called the CAGE questions, C-A-G-E. C stands for cut back. Have you ever felt or tried? Uh, have you ever felt that you should cut back on your drinking or tried to cut back? Number two is A, have you ever drank alone? Number three is G, have you ever felt guilty about drinking? And number four is E, have you ever had an eye opener or a drink first thing in the morning to get over a hangover or to get through the day? And if you're answering yes to two or more of those questions, then, you know, this could be a, something, a sign that you have a problem, that this might be negatively affecting your life. So I just wanted to make sure that we mentioned that. Of course, there are other signs of uh, that you have a drinking problem or that you could be an alcoholic. You know, a Google search is going to take care of those. But I wanted to make sure that we got those questions out there because those seem to be really cutting to the heart of the matter. And next, you know, what do you do if you identify that you have a problem? Okay, seek support. Just talk to somebody. It doesn't matter where you start. It's going to be a path and a journey, but just take it one step at a time because eating an elephant, you know, even doing something that feels overwhelming starts with the first bite. And so just do something, reach out to someone, someone who cares about you uh, or someone who, you know, is, is working at one of the many resources that are available for uh, people who are trying to, you know, free themselves from alcohol addiction like we discussed, like Al-Anon, like we were talking about, and many of the other ones. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody, for such a great show. Hopefully people in the audience um, got something out of it. Chris, any parting words uh, before we wrap this one up? And maybe please uh, mention your website if people want to contact you. So, yeah, if anybody actually wants to, you know, chat with me about this issue, I'm happy to as well. And you can reach me at chris at constructive.com. And the website's the same. It's coinstructive.com. Uh, I just thank you for having me on. You know, I've actually, I've talked to quite a few people in, you know, the crypto and blockchain space about this. As, you know, time has kind of gone on, I've come across people who also either don't drink anymore or are in the same position who have either talked to me about the situation that I've gone through because they're wondering what kind of steps that they should take. And, and I think, you know, Stephanie, you know, what you said was, uh, was really important and Tatiana, how you were mentioning how you want to still help and support your friend. I think if you, if a person comes to you and they, and they want help, like, I don't know how to get started. The first thing I think would be to like sit them, sit down and make a list of things that they like, things that they want to change. And that's part of the help of the self you know, reflection component to that. And, and that will be a good starting point for you to say, look, I can't help you with everything along the way. And I know you need help and I still want to be there for you, but it, you're right. It's the baby steps, setting some of those things up and letting that person help take the steps that they need to, to accomplish the goals, to become completely independent and uh, live a more sober life. Awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. Please share this episode with your friends and family. Use it as a way to start a conversation. It's obviously not an easy road, but I do think that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So thank you very much for listening. Please go to proofoflovecast.com to check out some more episodes. And thanks very much. Also, if you're coming to New York for consensus and the Magical Crypto Conference, we're doing an event May 11th. Me and Mike Salvi, it's going to be live music and comedy and it's a community event so we hope to see you there thanks once again and we'll see you all later thanks bye show me your heart Like cryptocurrency, politics, economics, activism, or art? Then check out the Tatiana Show, where you can learn all about it in a fun and non-intimidating way, as if you're just hanging with friends. Go to the TatianaShow.com and listen now. Ross Ulbricht is serving a double life sentence without parole for all nonviolent charges for creating a website. Please help free this peaceful man. 
Go to freeross.org and sign and share the petition. Thank you for listening to Proof of Love. Please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Proof of Lovecast. More episodes can be found at proofoflovecast.com. And make sure you leave a review on iTunes and tell your friends. Proof of Love has been brought to you by CryptoMediaHub.com, a boutique marketing and PR agency for Bitcoin and beyond.